Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Unfiltered Historian Presents. And you might notice that we don't have an unfiltered conversations title tonight. It's a little different. We are, it's the 27th of November, so we're in the anniversary of the Battle of Mine Run, or the Mine Run campaign, and we have none other than Chris Mikowski with us to talk some Mine Run tonight. So we are very ecstatic for that. Chris, welcome to the Unfiltered Historian. I believe this is your first time on the Unfiltered Historian. We were Mr. Oculio at one point. Way back when we were still trying to figure out the interwebs and how we go about broadcasting, but You're we sort of figured. With my book tie, don't oh, I appreciate that. That my Xbox gamer tag from so long ago. <laughs> I'm glad somebody still remembers me as that. But now the unfiltered historian can finally have an episode with Mikowski. We are so excited up. to have you. <laughs> I grew up. That was quick. That was like Mar was it March or April of last year? Oh, that was, was it? really quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was quick. Wow. Awesome. Well, again, welcome aboard, man. I'm really excited to have you tonight. And uh, Darren has really inspired this episode. Uh, he was talking a lot about Mine Run and trying to um, really put some light on that from our aspects. We haven't talked a lot about Mine Run, and we began to dive into uh, what we call the Forgotten Fall. I'm sure you've heard it called as such. And we talk about places like Bristow Station and Rappahannock Station. And, you know, we talked a little bit about that, but I think Mine Run is also very important to the beginning of the Overland campaign and kind of how that's going to play out in 1864. So without further ado. Uh, it is uh, it is one of those things people, you know, jump from Gettysburg to the wilderness and assume nothing took place in the months in between. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, right. That, that's what we and, discussed, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's so much going on during that period, and the armies are in constant contact. It's just that there's no huge battle that results in tens of thousands of casualties, but it's a small trickle, you know, where there's a cavalry engagement that might have one or two uh, or, or uh, skirmishers that might open up and someone gets wounded or something like that. So the casualty numbers are small, but constant uh, right after Gettysburg, right up through the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me, my, my knowledge on this is very scarce. I have both uh, your book and I have the Mind Run campaign maps with me as well, um, as I plan to read those tonight. But I, I've been so into the Titanic recently out of nowhere that just kind of my first historical obsession was that. So I blame that for taking a lot of my time from it. But that's one of the things I really liked about Darren bringing this is I wanted to give him the opportunity to help and really highlight this episode and have this kind of his baby. He was really excited to do this. So this is more for, you know, him to talk to you tonight, too. I, of course, want to be a part of this conversation just because I, I live in the area and you know you and I have walked some battlefields before so we got to do some chit chat sure. there but I've only been able to go to Payne's Farm and Seal and not that that's the bad thing Payne's Farm is incredibly awesome I, I enjoyed being out there and seeing that um, Joe LaFleur and I have actually walked that a few times um, but I still my knowledge on that and like you said it's so obscure when it's not that major battle that a lot of people were probably even looking at the title and saying what is mine run uh, yeah and what you know I think there? what one thing that might be useful for us too is we think it's you know six o'clock p.m. our time. Um, mine run is literally just down the road from both of us. Um, mm -hmm. Daz, a little farther for you to get there, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, uh, uh, you know, back in 1863, at this very moment, the battlefield is littered with the, the dead and the dying and the wounded, the detritus of mm -hmm. battle that's scattered across the fields, um, and so it's it's really a I think an evocative time to think about that landscape of misery and these wounded guys um, and, and both sides, both armies trying to make sense of what happened because neither of them were expecting that fight. It's cold. Guys are freezing, although not as cold as it's going to get uh, a little bit later in the campaign. Um, so it's just this miserable, miserable landscape back in 1863 at this very moment. Right. Now, if, am I correct in saying that General Warren is kind of a, figure here that should be praised? Uh, Warren doesn't have a whole lot with Mine Run, except uh, with, with the Payne's Farm fight. Uh, but certainly okay. the overall Mine Run campaign, absolutely. Um, you know, on this uh, anniversary of today's battle, um, he's kind of holding the Union Center and desperately waiting for the right wing of the army to show up, uh, led by Blinky French. I was going to give some extra <laughs> there to Blinky. <laughs> <laughs> actually, before you move on, I've got something to ask, actually. So yeah. I'm going to go and move away from the battle just for a minute, because I thought it was funny. So, um, hang on, I've lost my place now. Um, where is it? I was going to ask this really good, actually. Um, one thing I've always loved about the Civil War, and you brought out because you said blinky French. And, of course, I was watching your video, Chris, um, on the, that you did in 2019 for a uh -huh. Civil Wars uh, Symposium. And, uh, well... 
I mean, you're very good, uh, you know, and successful at what you've done. But I mean, you could have a sideline as a stand-up comedian because you are quite funny in that. I must admit, <laughs> it's good. You do make some funny jokes in that. Um, I've put a link up for that so people can watch it. But um, one thing I've always loved about the Civil War is some of the nicknames given to some of the generals. So I thought it would be fun to see if we, how many we could get. Oh, how, how many we could remember. You're throwing me for a loop. Oh, yeah, there's quite a few, isn't there? Yeah, can there I are. start with old brains? Yeah, old I mean, brains. obviously you've got um, <laughs> old brains, yeah. Well, it's and me Alex. is the, um, pardon my French, the goddamn nope. goggle-eyed snapping turtle. I uh, love it. As men call them. Uh, I don't know if anybody gave him that nickname to his French, uh, to his face, excuse me. But his his uh, staff officer, Theodore Lyman, called him Old Peppery, which I thought was hilarious. I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Old Peppery. Was, he was a pretty peppery. Yeah. So um, other folks. Uh, well, of course, and then we, if we're just talking mine run, we've got Turdy George Sykes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, on the Confederate side, um, we've got old Jube, Jubal Early, who's standing mm-hmm. in for old Baldy. I don't know what his yeah. old, old guys who are only my dirty old man. Who's that one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lee's the uh, the old man, the gray fox. Um, so those would be some guys on that side. Um, but then you know, um, uh, if we get into the uh, like really uh, you know, double Dan Sickles, mm-hmm. um. You know, we could really dig in. You know, nobody's coming to mind at the moment because you've put me on the spot. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> me too. I'm, that was a very is this, good. No, it's actually your there. fault because of your video and saying about because you 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 keep mentioning Blinky French and it made me laugh and I just thought that would be interesting. To, to, to I was happy to see you do it, that you know? because my sunken road tours and we talked about French. I would do that blinkiness and and they would get it. Yes, they would get a kid out of that. You know. <laughs> And the more he drank, the more he blinked. So uh, that's funny. How, how pickled he was by how much drinking he was doing. So, no, but great. there what wasn't there one called Lee's Dirty Old Man or something? Uh, yeah, old man. Jubal Early was uh, Lee's Bad oh, yeah, Old Man. It. Yep, yep. Um, so uh, yeah, and of course uh, Longstreet old man. Uh, is uh, Old Pete or you know mm-hmm. um, Lee's Old War Horse. Now uh, so. there's a no, I don't know if it's is it Robertson's Tavern that rings a bell when it comes to Mine Run. Yeah, yeah. Or am I having? Okay. Yeah. So what, what is that play? And I'm big into a lot of the historic homes of the area. And I'm, I'm not sure that it's still standing. And Noel Harrison, I blame for this, for getting me obsessed with all the old homes and archaeology and just different sites of, around the areas here. Um, but I have a feeling there's something significant about Robertson's Tavern. And So if you were traveling through the wilderness, 70 square miles of second growth deciduous jungle Mm -hmm. um, and heading down today, what would be modern Route 20 at the time, it was Orange uh, Orange Turnpike because it was heading Mm -hmm. toward Orange Courthouse. Um, Robinson's Tavern or Robertson's Tavern, it was called both, um, sat at this intersection as you're heading toward the west. And so it was kind of like a day's travel into the wilderness. So it was a good wayside stop for folks who were coming from one way or the other as they were uh, passing from Orange toward Fredericksburg or or vice versa. In the same way that Chancellorsville, for instance, was or Dowdle's Tavern or you know, Wilderness Tavern. Uh, it right. was one of those sorts of uh, waysides. So that's going to be sort of the rendezvous point as Meade moves his army from the Culpeper side of the Rapidan River across to... Um, basically converge at Robinson's Tavern and swing up and around behind Robert E. Lee's army, which is there stationed at Orange. Um, unfortunately, Lee sees him coming, so Lee's able to mobilize, and Meade's not able to get across there in time. But that tavern intersection then becomes really important because that's where his, Meade's army is supposed to concentrate. And um, mm. it's a good, solid position for them to hold. So when the Confederates actually show up by surprise, uh, the, the Federals actually have a really good spot from which to uh, hold on to that fight on that first day on the 27th. Okay. Yeah, so like my initial impression, and again, like my, my knowledge on Mine Run is very slim to none right now, but um, my initial impression is Clark's Mountain being kind of the the eyes and ears with Lee. He's able to see a lot of this from Clark's Mountain, if I'm not mistaken. This is sort of a vantage point for him. And of course, uh, Clark's Mountain is a bastion almost. This is a very impregnable position for Lee to be holding. And if I'm not mistaken, not mistaken, this is somewhat of an an attack field for the Union Army. They're trying to bring Lee out of this position he's holding on Clark's Mountain. Well it's and, and Clark's Mountain they- isn't isn't like um you know Lee's holding it as an observation point, but his main okay. line 
is basically um, blocking the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And if you sort of look at your mm. computer screen and, and think of that as a, a map, that's going to be kind of our, our plane. Um, the Orange and Alexandria basically goes from the top right corner of your computer screen to the bottom left corner of your computer screen. And they've been fighting okay. along this axis throughout the fall. Um, that's what takes them up to Bristow, brings them back down to Rappahannock Station. And Lee basically falls back toward the lower left corner of your computer screen and blocks the railroad, figuring that Meade's going to keep coming at him in that direction from Brandy Station. So what uh, Meade actually tries to do is, rather than go head on, is he swings basically straight south to the bottom center of your computer screen and then goes along the bottom edge of your computer to try to get to that bottom left corner. Um, and that's how he's going to get in around Lee's army. What Lee's able to do is then, you know, from his vantage point at Clark Mountain, um, he's going to see the federal movement and he's going to drop down and intercept Meade's uh, movement. Um, so Meade's movement depends on surprise. It depends on secrecy. It depends on speed. And he's able to accomplish some of these things at the start of the campaign. And then he quickly loses his speed. He quickly loses his secrecy um, and things fall apart on him pretty quickly. Mm. One, one thing I got from uh, this this campaign, as I've seen, I've, I've only been researching it for two weeks myself, you know, um, is the fact that they're using the same fords that they used during the Overland campaign. You know, it's literally like a rehearsal in a way for that that's going to happen in the spring of 64, isn't it? Um, uh, yeah, these boards all along the Rapidan and Rappahannock rivers get a lot of usage um, through the Chancellorsville campaign. Um, again, um, through the fall, uh, you know, the battles of Kelly's Ford all are, are really centered around these uh, these boards. And then again, mine run, and then again in the Overland campaign. Um, not all of them get used all of the time, but you know, all of these river crossings are really important. Just sort of depending on where the army's at, and moving to, um, different fords come into play at different times. Okay. And sorry, uh, nothing really goes right either, does it? So you have pontoon problems, you've got weather problems, um, yeah. and, and, and losing you know, on the, the element of the, surprise. Yeah, on the morning of the 26th, when, when Meade first starts going, he's got the cover of fog, and he's actually able to take advantage of that and get his men up and moving. The problem is once they get to the river, um, things start falling apart because, A, his um, right flank, Again, as I mentioned earlier, led by Blinky French, um, mm -hmm. they get moving slowly, and that creates a bottleneck with John Sedgwick behind them. They get to the river. Nobody's done some reconnaissance to figure out the best way to get across. They think the ford is all right, but they don't know what sort of uh, Confederate force is waiting them on the other side. And then the real kick, and this is just like dumb bad luck. Um, they knew that they had to build some pontoon bridges to get the armies across. They brought the pontoons with them. They were ready to go. And a big rainstorm a couple days earlier had swollen the river just enough so that they were one pontoon boat short on two of their bridges. <laughs> and so they had to then construct trestles to finish that span. And that just takes an incredible amount of time and uh, really is a delay. So Ty, when you mentioned um, uh, Robinson's Tavern, the idea was to rendezvous there by the night of the 26th. The army is able to just get across the river by the night of the 26th. And they're going to have to push forward on the 27th to Robinson's Tavern instead. Okay. And then just to add one last insult to injury, um, because it's my favorite line from the whole campaign, um, Prince's column starts moving across the river and they take the wrong road and don't realize it. And then French says that he found himself deep within the bowels of the enemy. And he Ooh. has to turn around. I know, it's like, oh, proctology, yeah. no wonder. In the city. <laughs> and uh, so he has to backtrack and then find his way uh, and get himself into a spot that allows him and the Sixth Corps behind him to get across deep within the bowels of the enemy that sounds so, interesting yeah very poetic um very i have a map that you mentioned a map and this is one of the older maps from the library of congress but i mean correct me if I'm wrong is this something worth looking at is this a map we should be referencing oh when yeah, we talk about the great, battle? Uh, yeah that's Perfect. a great little map yeah um, cool so if you need a map or if you want to explain it just give me the cue and i can click that up there and we can okay. all see that and well, why don't we it. toss it up there real quick here and we'll absolutely know we're, we're talking about it um, so there you can see the Rapidan River across the top of the screen, and uh, you can see some red and some blue fortifications. This map is showing um, simultaneous actions um, in one screenshot, if you will, so it's a little confusing. But basically, if you're starting in the upper right 
of the map where it says Dan River, the federal army is going to cross uh, boards that they're going to use to, and they're going to come down and try to converge at a place called Robinson's Tavern. Um, and then they're going to um, start pushing forward along, it says Turnpike to Orange. I don't know if you can see it. It cuts across roughly mm -hmm. the bottom one third of the screen. And they're going to go on my screen from right to left toward where you can see a big cluster of uh, of a red off to the left the idea is to march right off that map and get to orange um, but lee's able to come up and and uh, counteract um so that's kind of what creates these uh, these different opportunities um when we're originally looking at the battle maps here on the 27th you'll see the red line right down kind of the um the left third of the map and it stretches over into the kind of the center um mm -hmm. and that's the initial a confederate line and you'll see the federals have nice uh, strong lines pretty straight lines up there at the top yeah they do yeah. i'm seeing notable sites on this too i mean there's a blue line around the wilderness tavern yeah yeah um, that's it, so it's not a first for these union troops to be outside of the wilderness tavern such as you know we see in 1864 at the wilderness and that's right now just looking at this map that's a revelation to me knowing that wow they were actually that close to, or they were basically in the wilderness at this point so this yeah, is their first visit to the wilderness uh, when when Meade moves across the river his left flank is is uh, led by tardy george sykes followed by john <laughs> newton's um first corps um and sykes believe it or not makes pretty good time as he gets across the river and um he establishes a great spot and then Meade's worried that he's over there and isolated and so he'll actually have to pull back until the rest of the army can cross at the other two pontoon crossings so once everyone finally starts to get that beachhead on the south side of the river Sykes will then cross again and he'll swing all the way up and over to the wilderness tavern he'll come down the orange plank road um, it'll take him down um, kind of the uh, you know uh, the southernmost part of that battlefield um, and um, it's going to be a, you know, we talk about a preview of the wilderness. We're going to have um, federal troops on the Orange Plank Road and Robert E. Lee's Confederates under George Heath uh, or Henry Heath, mm -hmm. excuse me, are going to what, march up that road and under orders not to bring on a general engagement. And they're going to smack right into um, Sykes's Fifth Corps. And there's going to be fighting along the Plank Road, even though Heath's under orders not to uh, really start to bring on that engagement. Um, and that's the yeah. second time in within the space of four months <laughs> or five months. Yeah. And that's going to have you listen, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's going to have oh, huge God. implications because at the wilderness, Heath will again be coming down that road. Uh, under the same orders, don't bring on a general engagement. And so finally he'll learn his lesson and not bring on a general engagement at a time when if he had behaved as he had the first two times, he could have swept forward, captured the Brock Road, Plank Road intersection, and it would have changed the entire complexion of the Battle of the Wilderness. So he finally learns his lesson, third time's a charm at the wilderness, uh, at exactly the wrong time for the Confederates uh, for him to learn that lesson. Uh, right. So here's one of several ways in which Mine Run is going to kind of serve as a preview for the wilderness. Wow. Can, I, can, can I just um, bring something Please. in? Because um, I've been reading... Uh, uh, Elijah Hunt Rhodes uh, diaries and he mentions quite a lot there's a quite a big there's about three pages actually about um mm -hmm. this uh the you know the mine run campaign and and one thing that really jumped out at me and made me laugh it said because obviously we mentioned the weather it's raining and well we live in mud we sleep in mud we almost eat mud and that this gives you an idea of you know the weather conditions for these poor guys you know yeah. Uh, and to the benefit of the Federals, um, although it doesn't seem like it at first, uh, the weather will turn bitterly cold in the campaign um, and it'll freeze up all that mud. And that's actually what's going to allow them to make their getaway in relative mm -hmm. safety at the end of, uh, of the campaign. Because imagine if they were trying to slip away got bogged down in that mud and then Lee jumps out of those works and comes after him. That's a disaster uh, waiting mm -hmm. to happen. So. And that's that's kind of what my idea was when I was, you know, getting into this was I liked uh, Kenneth No's book. I'm sure you've read uh, The Weather in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, one thing he, you know, really writes in a lot of his chapters in that book is how the weather plays a part in a lot of the retreats or a lot of the getting to safety, if you will, with these armies, um, whether it be at things that 
factored into Fort Sumter or Fredericksburg. I mean, we, we know a lot about Fredericksburg and the cold and, and then the unseasonable warmth that takes place on December 13th. But we're looking at Mine Run today and we're talking about what you just mentioned, that it froze and the mud that Elijah Hunt Rhodes just described to us being almost his meal turns into an avenue of safety for the Union Army, which to me is rather incredible to see again how important weather is to the war and some of the operations around it. I mean, that's just to think that if if it was muddy and if it was still getting into that warmth or if it was 20 degrees warmer than it ended up being, we could be humming a different tune when it came to the outcome of the Mine Run campaign. Right, right. Um, so it's just a, uh, you know, weather is a huge, huge factor. And it's it's a miserable experience for these soldiers because over the course of this campaign, the the uh, weather drops to sub-freezing mm. temperatures. Guys who are out on picket duty freeze to death when they're out there. Um, a lot of accounts of guys having their canteens freezing solid on them. Um, and, you know, and mm. that's a huge factor in, in why Warren calls off the assault. Um, that is supposed to be kind of the grand, um, you know, flank attack. Uh, One of the things that he specifically says, um, you know, it's going to take about eight minutes for his men to get across that open attack plane. And the thought of wounded soldiers lying out there freezing to death uh, really chilled him. Um, And, you know, no pun intended there. I mean, he, he was just absolutely appalled at the thought that these wounded guys would be out in this freezing cold temperature with no help. Also, I just want to bring something up actually about that because um, and I'm going back way back. So I'm going back to an English Civil War battle that happens in uh, October 14, uh, 1647. You are going and, way back. Um, there's an incident of it being cold at night and uh, because they were wounded, uh, but because it was so cold, their, 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 their wounds actually froze. Uh-huh. So they actually mm-hmm. suffered, you know, even more because they're, sitting, they're laying there dying of the cold, but they're also dying of their wounds as well. It's uh-huh. awful. Uh-huh. And and it must have been a similar situation. That's that was the point I was going to make. Yeah, yeah. you know, and for these poor guys. Yeah. So that's what I love about talking to you. Every time we talk about civil war, and then you're like, and then in the 1400s, <laughs> he does it all the civil war context, all different. <laughs> 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 Darren, thank you for that. Now, um, again, we're going off this cold. I know it's not mine run related, but my my union ancestor in the first United States sharpshooter actually ends up in the Veteran Reserve Corps because of Fredericksburg and the cold. Um, And I I attribute this to, I call it double dysentery because it's literally what he gets at Harrison's Landing earlier in the war, uh, right before Fredericksburg. Yeah, it's bad. Like he gets uh, yellow fever and then contracts dysentery. And then when he he heals from that, goes to Harrison's Landing to sort of recoup and then gets it again because of the just rampant outbreak that is really at that location. And as he heals, he goes to Fredericksburg and ends up pretty much, and I don't know if it's hypothermia or what exactly it is, but he loses his sight temporarily, loses the ability to speak, and he loses the ability to hear. And that factors into him having to leave and end up getting a pension for it uh, post-war. Isn't there, a, he isn't actually, there a Metallica song about that? I believe <laughs> it's called one, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> he mentions landmines too, so it's I'd have to dig oh, and that's find out if you are not at the bar and it not being able to see in here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but and that's something I, I really do think about is yeah. that you know when we talk about the cold. I'm just I had a an ancestor who coincidentally is a great grandfather, not a great great. I mean, literally great grandfather, which is. Wow. And to be 26 with one of those, a lot of people turn their heads like, "Are you sure, buddy?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's my dad's." grandfather like it's we're really in line. yeah he my dad was born in 1948 so i mean a little bit older and his father was born in 1902 so it was his father that served in the first united states sharpshooters hailing from albany new york and ended up in washington dc and then settling in colonial beach virginia wow. um yeah, it's a very cool story but I, I look back on that and try to understand a little bit about you know, we were talking about weather and, you know, according to mine running that, that cold weather. And then Darren brought up our wonderful 1400s account there. About oh, sorry, 1642. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, a little bit closer than 1400. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, Jamestown <laughs> would have been founded then. Wouldn't like, it, excuse me. Um, we weren't <laughs> going to talk about that, remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Jamestown, 1607. But anyway, it's, it's going, interesting. Going back, going, going back to the um, the the battle. Um, so the Battle of Payne's Farm and New Hope Church. So can you talk us for a little bit about that, Chris? Sorry, Charles, I didn't mean to cut you off, mate. No, you're fine. I'm more interested in this. 
Well, Let me give you um, just a couple um, kind of um, time stamps for us to follow as we're walking through Mind's Run because it, it does get a little complicated. So, and no references to the restrooms this time. <laughs> 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 so the um, uh, the battle or the campaign, I should say, starts on the 26th of November. It's Thanksgiving Day. Um, they only get the first just Thanksgiving Day. Is that what, what's that? The first Thanksgiving Day, is that correct? Uh, like, as in, yeah. like the the national holiday you know today. Yes, yes, yep. And um, you know, these guys are dreaming of home and uh, family gatherings and loved ones, and they're like walking through the mud that Elijah Hunt Rhodes talks about, and eating a hardtack, uh, flying Thanksgiving. They get across the river uh, a little slower than expected. They rendezvous, um, pushing forward as I mentioned earlier, toward Robinson's Tavern on uh, three different roads. The uh, right flank gets tangled up at Payne's Farm, which is going to be the most significant fighting of the campaign. Uh, that's a battlefield that's been preserved by the American Battlefield Trust. So there is a place you can actually go and walk that. Um, the 28th, uh, the Federals get ready to push forward and attack the Confederates again, but the Confederates have slipped away and created a fortification on the west bank of the small stream known as Mine Run. And so then Meade's trying to figure out what to do about that. Can't find a, um, um, you know, can't find a good opportunity. So one of his subordinates, um, Governor K. Warren is going to come to him and say, Hey, I've got an idea. We can kind of march around the Confederate right flank. So on the 29th, Warren's going to pull his men out. Uh, he's in temporary command of the second corps during this part of the battle or this part of the war. And he's going to march to the South and try to get around Lee's right flank. But by the time he gets into position, it's too late in the day. So he's going to then camp out with an attack at dawn on the morning of the 30th. Um, and uh, at that point, um, Lee is going to extend his line to meet that threat, and Warren's going to call that attack off. And uh, as a result, um, there will not be a major battle. Uh, Meade will come inspect the situation, realize that Warren's making the, the, the correct call. Um, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit more about that and unpack it a little bit. Um, and so that night, they'll kind of, uh, you know, they'll spend the rest of the day in the 30th trying to find an opportunity that doesn't exist. And that night, Meade will then pull back and, and head back to his encampments around Brandy Station and Culpeper. Um, Lee is content to sit in his fortifications and wait for Meade to come at him. And, um, you know, that'll be, again, a preview of the Overland campaign. By the time he finally decides to launch an attack forward, he, that's how he discovers that Meade has given him the slip. Um, so that's kind of the broad overbrush of the events that take place <clears throat> in the campaign. And uh, am I right in saying that this is the first time they use fortifications to that to that extent, and I think that's yeah. and I think that's one reason why Meade um, and and Warren call off the attack because they'd really never seen fortifications like that up to this point in the war. There had certainly been field fortifications; some exist at Chancellorsville, for instance. Um, but it's uh, you know uh, something that Meade's men work on. Excuse me, that that Lee's men work on with great effort for a couple days. And so they've got um, pretty extensive, formidable looking fortifications. Warren's never had to go up against anything like that. And he's an engineer. He knows right. what he's looking at. And suddenly it's like, oh, wait. Um, uh, Not a good idea. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and also you mentioned quite a lot in your book about, um, and also in that um, uh, ECW thing, um, that Mead obviously he writes a lot to his wife, doesn't he? Um, but yeah. to his wife, he's sort of really open and like a bit more sort of open about what's going on. And you mentioned that, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought now, um, about the fact that um, also he gets um, a lot of criticism from the press afterwards for not um, sending his men across that field because he knows they're going to get slaughtered. And actually, he did the right thing there, didn't he? I 100% agree with Meade's decision. Uh, now, it's easy for me to, to you know, make that call for my armchair General Perch years later, but um, I think it, it is a more important moment for Meade than the Battle of Gettysburg um, because he shows tremendous moral courage 
in calling off that attack. I mean, he's the Harry Truman of the, the Army of the Potomac, right? The buck stops here. So Warren oh, makes the call him. not to attack. And Meade at first is like, what? You know, and he blows his top off. Uh, you know, he's got half my army. This man has ruined me. He storms out to that left flank of his army. And he and, and Meade engage in this heated discussion. And then Meade takes a look at Warren's trying to show him. And Meade realizes Warren's right. So then he comes to this point, like, well, do I launch my attack anyway? Because as Daz points out, like, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on me yeah. to do something. And he says, no, I'm not going to waste the lives of my men. And he sends word to the rest of the line, call off the assault. Um, you know, we're not going to uh, go forward with this because this is going to be a slaughterhouse and I'm not going to sacrifice my men. And in that letter to his wife that you mentioned, and it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful letter, he says that um, there will be critics who will say, I should have tried and failed to prove that the works were <laughs> unassailable. Um, That's actually and the sadness of him. Like, why? Why should I do something I know is going to fail just to prove that I would fail? Like, that's ridiculous. These are lives of men, not just figures, right. on, you know, in a spreadsheet. And so he's, um, uh, you know, really adamant about not wasting his army. Uh, and that kind of ties into a question Anthony Howes Net is asking: mm -hmm. How many men does does Meade have? And he's around fifty eight. Thousand, uh, you know, I have to double check that. He's got two corps that he has lost. He's he sent his 11th and 12th corps out west. Uh, they're in the Chattanooga campaign. They were sent to counteract the movement of James Longstreet's first corps, which was shifted west from the Confederate side. Um, and so Meade only enjoys an advantage of about five to three during this campaign, which is not enough from, to make him feel comfortable about um, mm -hmm. carrying on offensive operations and defending the capital. Remember, he's still saddled yeah. with that um, uh, requirement. He's got to defend so, the capital. So really then, Lee's got a really good opportunity here to really damage the Army of the Potomac, hasn't he? Before, like the Overland campaign. So we're obviously when those, um, like you just mentioned, those guys come back from, from the West and then obviously Grant joins the, the party, but um, it's going to be stronger. And of course, they're going to get more men and more resources. So Lee had a real good opportunity here not to actually sit in trenches and actually do something, some damage, you know? Didn't he really? When you think about it, and the myth is, oh, Lee was really weak after Gettysburg, you know. Yeah, and that's uh, one reason why Lee de decided to take the offensive um, during the Bristow phase of the campaign. Is like, you know, Meade's just sitting there. There's got to be an opportunity, and 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 Meade will use his his diminished size to try to kind of get around Meade and make a strike. Um, I think. Uh, let me um, just check myself. I think I said 58, and, and Meade's really close to 78. I think I just misspoke there. And then uh, Lee is down somewhere in the um, like. Um, upper 40s i'd say mm -hmm. like 47 48 something like that um and uh, yeah so numerically it is a real opportunity for lee to uh, make something happen and he tries um and uh you know it forces me to, to pick up and retreat all the way back up all the way to, to sarah now i have a question that actually is dating back to rappahannock station in regards to mine run what is me thinking his chances of success on the launching of this campaign are in his experiences at places like Rappahannock station and Bristol station, what was, you know, really going through his head? Because again, we, we had this notion that after Gettysburg, nothing's happening. There is just a bump on a log with the, the army of the Potomac and Lee's army of Northern Virginia, which is completely false. Like we know that for a fact that there is a lot going on in between the two armies, but is, is Meade playing off of these incidents at these engagements that are happening after Gettysburg and using those to formulate, ideas and maneuvers into mine run or is this an entirely new campaign kind of coming out of the woodwork here yeah um uh, this is a really depressing time for me because you know he wants to do something uh, but he just doesn't feel like he's got the offensive capability because he is still saddled with defending washington so okay. uh, and, and then he proposes several different plans that lincoln nixes as a result of that need to defend the capital. Um, and so, you know, Meade talks about like, I always wondered what it would be like to be a commander of the army. And now I wish I was just leading a division into battle at the front row. Like, this is terrible. I hate this. And, and, <laughs> and you know, 
several times Halleck will harass him and say, like, who is bullying you? And oh, Mead flat out funny. just says, like, if you don't think I'm doing a good job, relieve me. You know, I've, I've got – I'm doing my best, and if you don't think it's good enough – Believe me. Hey, all you had to do was mention Halleck for me, and I understood exactly what you were trying mm-hmm. to say. I have, I have my personal feelings towards Halleck, and I've, I've sometimes I let them know more than again. Her. I mean, the 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 reason me and Tyler get on so well is we've got the same similar view on Burns' side. Although we know, you know, he did make a few uh, some big mistakes. Um, we also have sympathy for him, especially at Fredericksburg, because he does the, get thrown under the, the bus. The amount of political pressure, for doesn't he? We always keep going back to that same thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the biggest thing that you know. And this is a podcast all its own, but that's the I'm biggest great. thing. When Grant comes east, Lincoln has finally learned some important lesson, and he leaves Grant alone in a way that he has never left alone mm-hmm. in the Potomac. And so, you know, Meade's doing his best. Like he wins Rappahannock Station, sends these all these captured flags back to the War Department, and Stanton won't even receive David Russell, who was wounded during the battle what? and was escorting the flags back. Yeah. And Stanton won't even see him. It's a huge snub to Meade. And so, you know, Meade's thinking, you know, mid November, mm. we need to maybe start thinking about winter quarters. And it's like, um, no, you need to launch one more campaign. And that's that's horrendous for me to even think. I didn't know that. That's that's honestly almost like and, and really George angered me. Um, Russell's a favorite. Reg- sorry, does George George was, hand his, sorry, does he hand in his reg- resignation when Grant comes over? Is that correct? He does. Or tries he does. to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, it's just, it's a natural reaction, um, you know, not out of spite or anything. It's just, he says, I assume you're going to want to install one of your guys in this mm-hmm. position. I understand the realities of that situation. Here's my resignation and uh, use me however you think you, you know, I can best serve you. Yeah. And uh, that's a, a, another one of those moments of great moral courage that Meade shows. He's a consummate professional. And uh, Grant, you know, says like that impressed me more than, then Meade's victory at Gettysburg, and I decided to keep him on. Um, so, Bringing it back to Russell really quickly, though, um, I, I talked quite a bit about him and gave him a lot of credit for Rappahannock Station, which I hope is due because, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of us go to sure. Upton, and, you know, you and I have talked about Upton plenty of times. I think you and I were the ones that had the discussion in Spotsylvania about how Mackenzie and Russell really are also still sort of the brains behind the Upton as well. A lot of the times these things that Upton are carrying out, which we may consider revolutionary or just these new implementations of warfare, a lot of the times Upton's the one carrying out the assault, not mm-hmm. the innovator behind the assault. Right. And so that's one thing I brought up at the Rappahannock Station talk that we did here on the podcast a few weeks back. And I mentioned that Russell is really the brains behind this. And Upton himself is the one that is writing to his sister and even writing into the official records. I'm not really the creator of this assault or this idea. I may have implemented my own, you know, ideas when it came to yelling that I had a larger force than I truly had when I assaulted the rebel works, but it's Brigadier General David Russell. Yeah, yeah. And, and to hear that, that he's just shunned away from Stanton like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and the thing that I like about that relationship is that Upton is the guy you want on the front lines because he oh, is absolutely. smart enough and innovative enough and independent thinking enough that he he's able to exploit the situation, whatever that might be, in the best possible way, you know, because he's very um, open-minded in his thinking. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. you know, certainly um, Russell's is, you know, very much in control about, you know, kind of how a lot of that comes together. Uh, McMahon um, at Spotsylvania. Martin McMahon, right? He, yep. A yep. Key, key role in developing that plan that ends up with Upton's name on it. Um, That's right. So, well, but yeah, Russell, uh, he he storms the works, uh, storms the redoubt there at Rappahannock Station, gets injured in the left foot, I believe, um, escorts these flags back to the War Department. And that, in fact, on his way back from that, the foot wound turned out to be worse than expected. And he's going to be out of the uh, commission for a while because of that wound. I believe Upton's out at Mine Run too, I think. Um, mm-hmm. He's terribly sick with an illness. And um, his surgeon, uh, Daniel Holt, not David yeah. Holt to be mistaken yeah. easily with the uh, Confederate from the Mississippi Brigade. But we have Daniel Holt actually writing that he needs to get home and see treatment fast yeah. because yeah. Upton is declining. Yeah. And Daniel helps. Holt's memoir, by the way, is one of the best memoirs, um, a, a Civil War surgeon's diary. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the best memoirs because he's a beautiful writer too. And he's like seeing, he's right in the stuff and he's seeing it all. So he's got to- I've been trying to find that 
every time I go to Gettysburg, I look at a few of these stores and nobody has it. I'm going to end up looking online for it eventually, but I want to buy it. Of course, I like to well, source Thank you for so another cool. recommendation. I, I do need a oh. Christmas present. So. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of books, Chris, I hope you don't mind if I just uh, no, throw good. that up there right now. Everything yeah. we're talking about right now, and yeah. this, I had to. Yeah. There's a there fantastic you ECW book. And you guys, I've been, I've been listening to that for two weeks on my journey home and on the way to work. So, yeah. If we want reading also, in the audio version, you get Chris telling you the story. <laughs> oh, it's you I narrating that one. Story that. time with Chris. Yeah. I love doing the uh, audio book for that. Yeah. That must be yeah, fun. I wish you would do more. I love it. Yeah, I think it's great. But, but yeah, guys, um, I definitely I, wanted I to show that here. The, yeah, sorry, the preservation side of it. Because until I got to the end of the audio book, I didn't realize that Ted Savis is the one that's that orchestrated with his friend the, the preservation of Payne's Farm. Uh, Payne's Farm had been had long uh, misidentified. So if you look at early works of the Payne's Farm book that George Scotch worked on, um, you know, uh, some, some great positives to it, but the battlefield didn't match up with the accounts and, and you know, the maps didn't quite. And, and that's really what got Ted puzzling through it. There was a whole supplement to Civil War Times Illustrated um, back when it was still called that, um, that was devoted to the Minor campaign. And again, the, the, the maps just didn't match up. So Ted went out and and starts exploring and um uh you know through through really conscientious work with the metal detector um he and his friend paul sacra um really kind of mapped that out and discovered where the battlefield was um the american battlefield trust um back in its earlier iteration is the uh, civil war preservation trust that actually mm -hmm. preserved that whole battle field they've mapped out a great uh, walking trail there fantastic interpretive signs written by uh, tim smith from gettysburg fame and uh, uh, gary edelman uh and um so you know thanks to the trust there is something you can see out there at mine run but the coolest thing is like most of the confederate line is still out there um, these formidable works that Warren was intimidated by. They're still there. They're just all in private hands. Um, so you can't really go battlefield tromping. Um, I've mm. been fortunate enough to get permission from a, a number of landholders out there to go and look in their uh, backyards. Um, but some of them, you know, I knock on the door and I got an old map, survey map from the Park Service from the 1920s or 1932. Oh, that's they're like, Sorry, oh, we're not buying that today. Can you leave, please? <laughs> <laughs> That would be my fear, but I think you got to see. No, no, I'm not selling you, you said anything. that these are some of the that. best trenches you've ever seen, right? Oh, that's so fantastic! Yeah, and you know, and people don't even know they're there. You know, like I'd, I'd knock on a door and oh. say, "Hey, can I look at your earthworks?" And they're like, oh, <laughs> "Excuse me, it's been the map and, Yeah, I walk right out to where in their backyard the work should be, and like, "Whoop, there they are!" And they're like, "Oh, is that what that is? I didn't even know what I had out here." You know? And uh, so. Yeah, fantastic earthworks. Um, some of the mm. best I've seen, best preserved works I've seen anywhere. So there's a lot out there. So that means just there's more preservation opportunities available at Mine Run. Well, let's hope that I see those in my lifetime being saved because that's something we definitely would love to learn more about. And I think that's what's, you know, it's not that I'm not interested in this battle by any means, but, you know, you and I know this especially. Terrain helps tremendously in understanding a battle and seeing this for yourself, being able to walk the ground that they fought on or served on. And, and just understanding that really helps to paint that picture in your head to make it all kind of come together. And with them inaccessible like that, or just in private hands, not preserved, it's it's tough to really get the full scope of what happened at Mine Run. And I'm learning so much just between the two of you talking about this tonight. And of course, I had the plans to read these, go through the maps and really understand it more. But it's, it's, it's extremely helpful to hear from someone who has seen the ground, walked the ground, and just has that that firsthand knowledge of the battlefield. Well, that's why I think preservation is so important because mm -hmm. you've got the battlefield, you've got a primary source that you can use to study the field, walk the ground, match it up with the accounts that you're reading and the official records and things like that. So when it, when a battlefield disappears, then you don't have that tangible connection and it's a lot easier to forget about. So, so people don't know Salem about my church. Marriage, so yeah, no, I was going to bring yeah. up Salem church. Yeah. Salem church yeah. I live in one of, unfortunately, I, I like living here, but it's yeah, the, the area I live in now is in his front room. Apparently from the maps I've seen in the, the Salem church neighborhood. And I think Noel Harrison echoed this for me too. I have either Cadmus Wilcox or one of the other Confederate move through my living room. Okay. And I'm, I'm in the Salem run neighborhood. If you're familiar with where that's at, it's just yeah. right behind the church. So there's obvious movement going on here. It may not necessarily be the focal point of the battle, but even in small instances like this, 
you know, we're right, I'm right outside of Salem Church. I could walk there and be there in two minutes. And you know this best. You can't even hear yourself think it's Salem Church. Uh, no. no, it's been sad. lost. And what is it that you said? Um, what I think it was O'Reilly that said this that people don't like to park up, they like to park down. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens to that ridge? away the whole ridge yeah yeah it's just, just gone away. but that diminishes the understanding of a very major part of that battle and you know in studying upton i have even a second newfound love with salem church um just from a having an ancestor captured in marie's height so he really has nothing to do with the battle at salem church he he's really on the may 3rd fight there in town mm -hmm. But even living here and rereading through uh, your and Chris's book, I just I got this new appreciation for it because I needed to understand what's going on with Upton here because the 121st still love him, even though he doesn't necessarily do exquisitely well here. Yeah. And that was one thing I wanted to paint when I start talking more about him next year in 2022 is like this, you know, people think Upton was just this fantastic general all throughout the war. Yeah. But we go to Salem Church and the fact that the 121st still adore him after that was pretty it's, impressive to me. Yeah. I, I think adore is a strong word. Respect. Yeah, I, respect. I, I, I mean, yeah. You know, he's a guy they don't love, but they sure respect him. You know, they'll because, follow him in the battle. That's right. Cause, cause yeah. he's leading into the battle. And I think that's right. So Daz, yeah. let me ask you a question since you're mm -hmm. well removed from the battlefields here, although you'll be getting a taste of them soon. Well, I hope so. Because right. if you haven't heard the news, we've got another variant going around causing havoc. Yes, yes. So let's hope. So, let's Fingers hope. Across, Fingers across. Uh, yeah. So, so what what intrigues you the most about the Mine Run campaign? Well, I, I must admit, I do want to go out now to Payne's farm. I must admit, since you know, it, it's just it's just the fact that it's not remembered. You know, it and and again, it's not remembered, is it, because of Ch um, Chattanooga and that great victory in Chattanooga, and it just got literally. Oh, don't that one don't matter because nothing really happened. It chucked in the bin, you know. And it's like, and I'm glad that you yourself, you know, focused on it, you know, because I, th I think because there's not a lot of material out there, is there? Not really. Well, it, it's funny. I was talking to someone about it earlier today when I wrote my book. By default it became the definitive work on my run because there's just nothing else. Really out there. There's not, I mean, George Scotch's maps in that one, what is, I can't even remember the authors of that Howard book that came out. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah, yeah, Howard uh, that. George was one of the co-authors of that. I can't remember. Oh, he was that. actually a co-author too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, I love the well, fact that, that it's in that same area. It's crazy that you've got all those battlefields that overlap each other, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, literally they on the same the spot, isn't it? I mean, Locust Grove, is that not the area that's used for the artillery during, you know, during the flank march? Is that correct? I can't remember. Uh, no, on the, uh, the the Confederates come up from that direction during the Wilderness Campaign. That's um, it, yeah. But Locust Grove today is a, kind of like the the official town name for a lot of the area that's covered by Mine Run. Mm -hmm. um, but they're marching through uh, during the Chancellorsville Campaign, during the Mine Run Campaign. During the wilderness campaign, a lot of that all fighting happens on overlapping fields. Yeah, Longstreet's coming in Virgiersville, right? During yeah. the yeah. um, yeah, he's out in Gordon. It's because of you start. guys. I'm starting to really, really love that area, yeah, and yeah. especially yeah. Central Virginia. And because you've got so much there, and also you know, um, you're you're you're. I know I keep bringing it up, I keep telling you, but your forgotten front book with um, Chris is just amazing. It's one of the best books I've ever re uh, read. Honestly, it's so it's so good, and I like the fact that you're focusing on something that, again, just got sort of chucked on the trash heap. Oh, well, that didn't happen, you know. Yeah. And it's just so interesting, you know. And you guys did the same for Salem Church and Second Fredericksburg because you know, and being frontline at the Park Service at the time, knowing that a lot of people heard there's a second battle. I can't tell you how many yeah. times a day yeah. I heard that. Well, I mean that that iconic photo of dead Confederates in the sunken road is from right. Second Fredericksburg, not first. Yep. Yeah. So it's, um, but, uh, you know, uh, Dan's going oh, back to you talked about with, with Chancellorsville a second or uh, Chattanooga a second ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really key because if people look at Chattanooga, which itself is often overlooked, um, and, they, and then they forget about mine run, but that was huge context for me in the moment. Um, you know, the army of the Potomac gets news about Chattanooga as they start marching toward mine run and they say, Hey, that's, that's good news to march on. But that, jacks up the stakes for Meade incredibly because here his his counterpart in the west scores this major victory so what are you doing there george 
you know, and so suddenly it's like, right, oh, some, a little bit know? of pressure added on to it, huh? Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, like, yeah, you got to have Gettysburg. But as the great sage Janet Jackson once said, what have you done for me lately? And so, like, like Meade's got to do something. And he doesn't because he calls it off, knowing that all this pressure's around him, all this stuff. And he says no. Um, and I just, I really respect him. Well, I tell you what, that it's inspiring a trip, Darren. I think we're going to have to take a oh, stroll uh, through Payne's um, Farm. Um, and... Get Gettysburg. I'm not going to Gettysburg anymore. That's going on the trash. <laughs> it's <laughs> totally worth going to Gettysburg. Totally worth it. Is. Oh, yeah, I know well. it is. I know it is. <laughs> I, I've been there. That's the thing. And I think I want to spend more time in Central Virginia, personally. Yeah. I can't but, blame um, you for that. We are Antietam Day because mm -hmm. I've never been to Antietam. I need to go to Antietam. And I need to make a pilgrimage back to that church in there, the Methodist church that I went to. It was a hospital used for a lot of the Confederate troops and uh, a wounded union as well. Um, but I made some friends in there recently, and they um, have a lot of records that I didn't know existed of some of the wounded that were treated there still at their hospital. So that's one of the main reasons I want to go back to um, Shepherdstown on the outskirts of Sharpsburg. There's some really cool stories. And uh, the Battle of Shepherdstown itself is a really unique battle in the Civil War, too. It's almost like mine run forgotten nobody knows that yeah. there's a i mean it's like balls bluff repeated there's huge bluffs and people are being pushed to the I mean, brim of those and I, I like to look at skettersburg as the disneyland of uh for civil war buffs <laughs> you know what i mean? I've heard that it a time is, or two it's yeah. like the disneyland of the civil war buffs that's yeah. where we all go we send the missus oh, to disneyland yeah, with like, the kids and we go to gettersburg see you later well, one of the things that, that i think is so important about this area and, and frank o'reilly taught me this early on in my own uh, education he said what makes this ground so important is that the park here covers 18 months of the war from fredericksburg in december of 62 through spotsylvania in may of 64. you've got you know fredericksburg chancellorsville wilderness and spotsy plus mine run which isn't covered by the park but it's still here and over the course of those 18 months the changes that happen in the war from personnel to politics to tactics um so so in order to really be able to to um really talk about those sorts of things in an educated way with a visitor you've got to know just a tremendous amount of stuff that goes on during the war and so it's that that's a lot different than a park like gettysburg which very important wonderful park but you know their action focuses on three days plus lincoln's visit in november um Antietam, you've got, you know, one day of battle and then, you know, the, the campaign. Um, for Fredericksburg, I've got to know about Antietam because of the Emancipation Proclamation, and that's the okay. context leading up to Fredericksburg. So it's just, as Frank said, like the, the stuff you have to know to work intelligently in this park um, really trumps any other experience you have elsewhere in the Civil War world. Absolutely. Definitely. And that's one thing, you know, that I, I think I can echo too, because I learned that same type of instance when I started here as just an intern back in 2015, huh? it feels like ages ago now, I shouldn't say it's only five years, but, or six years, wow, it's God, time's going like that. Well, you've got to add COVID years into that, that makes it feel longer. 25 then. <laughs> that's like dog years. <laughs> right, yeah, that is yeah we're now counting dog years, not, but that's no one thing I did. I was, <laughs> um, a fellow intern of mine, went. To, I went to Gettysburg for the first time in almost 10 years at that point, and it was seeing it in a new light, because when I went there, the only things I were pointing out, and even things like the film, was that's Fredericksburg. This is oh, oh my gosh, this is why this happens in '64. Like you see that there, the Dan Sickles Hazel Grove correlation. You know there are new things that I'm coming to Gettysburg. I'm not just thinking Little Round Top and its immediate consequences to Gettysburg. I'm thinking what is happening later. I'm thinking about what is happening to bring the men here to Gettysburg. So I think in hindsight, studying here at this park and being able to learn a lot from this park. I was able to understand Gettysburg even more. Mm -hmm. So I think it works in that way too. When you go to Antietam, you understand, you know, what, what Antietam does for the country afterwards as well, what it brings in. Um, and so that was really cool to learn at the park too. But I, I learned so much here. And like you were saying, there is so much that other battlefields influence to this park mm -hmm. uh, yeah. just because of the sheer 18 months that surround it and the history around this is, I mean, it's, unique there's no other park i think that really has a revisitation of battles yeah. in richmond is close you know because yeah 62 and the 64 campaigns um but petersburg right right south of it too yeah. it's you've got nine months there but uh but you know and that's why it's always fun to talk about you know mine run for instance because you got 
you know, so much going on. And that's one great story that nobody talks about yet. It's a mm-hmm. fantastic story. Uh, yeah, that's why I love the North Anna phase of the Overland campaign because everyone yeah. kind of skips from Spotsy down to Cold Harbor. Oh, North Anna, and then you're the one that in, you know turned and, me on. And North also, Anna too. Chris, you've got um, you actually live so your living room. You've got lines of um, Union soldiers in your living room, haven't you? Because Spotsylvania uh, battlefield sort of backs onto. Uh, they do. well actually uh, so where I, I actually live on the edge of the Chancellorsville battlefield and uh, EP mm-hmm. Alexander had his artillery in what is now my front yard um, and then my wife's family owns that big chunk of the Spotsy battlefield and so you know the Ninth Corps was there for the first week of the battle the Fifth Corps was there for the second week of the battle. Is it Thomas and, Stevenson? Uh, Thomas Greeley Stevenson. Yeah, yep. yep. I so love that. It was a great time. Burns, Burns, the way Burns line the was uh, mm-hmm. on your property. Is that right? Pardon? Yeah. Burnside's line during the Spotsylvania battle. Yeah. And I think that's one reason why uh, that section of the Spotsy battlefield never got preserved because Ambrose Burnside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, that guy again, isn't it? What is it? Frank says poor burn feels dreadfully. Or, that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. uh, George McClellan initially, isn't it? That says that. Poor burn feels feel dreadfully. When he got named commander of the Army of the Potomac, you know, it's like. But, but the main thing is, Chris has got Grant's doors, and uh, mm-hmm. hopefully one day I'll get to go and have a cheeky look at them. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah, that's one of the greatest parts about that place. But I mean, it's just this area, like you said, so unique and just so much yeah. history behind that. Um, I must admit, if I, if I had the money, I'd be there and I'd be living there. That's the end of that. Oh, no two ways about it. Man. You'd have to put up with me every day. <laughs> well, Chris, do you have anything else you'd like to? Add? I know you said you had to run around seven, and Darren and I are going to finish till seven thirty, which is some of our fun banter, and finish out some updates on Fredericksburg. But I know you um you had sure. till seven, so I want to. If you have anything you want to add, or anything you'd like to discuss before you you know pop off here. Yeah, I just uh, go back and, and reiterate that point about how important preservation is, because when you've got the mm-hmm. battlefield, then suddenly you've got something you can start walking, you can got some, you have something that you can use to help share the story, you've got a place to go, and that's a tangible reminder of that story. Um, that's uh, one reason why mine run off and gets forgotten about. Um, thankfully, the American Battlefield Trust has preserved Payne's Farm. It's a great field. Uh, kind of a Victory. chilly time to go out and walk there now, but it's a beautiful, beautiful path. So uh, I encourage folks to get out there and visit when they have the chance. And before you go, isn't yeah. there some automobile history out there at Payne's Farm? <laughs> there is an old abandoned vehicle out in it's the a Mercury, area. too. If oh, I'm, no, it's and not, I'm it's not a car it's guy. Not Ecto-1, is it? <laughs> no, it, I'll, you'll see it when we go. But uh, I think I sent you, me and Joe sent you a picture a long time ago because we were walking by there. And that was, it's not my big fascination, but I knew it was just, it's a different part of history. It's an older model. It's like yeah. 1950s or 60s, if I'm not mistaken. But if you go out there, make sure you look for the car if it's still yeah. there. It's, uh, it's kind of cool to see just on, that's what I love about preserving these sites because there's some things that are just not conventionally civil war related that you'll pop there's, up. There's actually like, a, oh, a vehicle a behind Potter's line at Spotsylvania too. If you get up. Is there the really? Oh, oh, so just a little something for you to go look for. Before I leave, I just want to say thanks to both of you guys. Um, uh, you're kind of what's the best about uh, civil war um, studies these days, you know, a couple guys who are, who are just so deeply devoted to the study of the field, who are taking their love and spreading the gospel. Uh, you guys know that's a big thing for me, and you guys are both doing it every day, and I really appreciate and admire the work that you guys do mm-hmm. along those lines. So thanks for having me today. I'm Absolutely, Chris, and sure. thank you for starting and, this. Um, Chris, one other spreading. thing. Like, that's have you got, got the Emergency Civil War t-shirts left over? Because I'll get, uh, I'll, 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 I'll I do. So, so when you show up, let me know. I'll make yes, sure. Please. Please. Yeah. Cheers, Mike. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Chris, thank you again. Like you said, thanks. You you are the one that inspired a lot of this. Yeah, to happen. definitely. You know, yeah. When I started, if it wasn't your book. We wouldn't even know about it, really, apart from Wikipedia. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Well, it's my privilege, guys. Thank you so much for for what you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you all for having Chris out here tonight. It was oh, yeah. it was amazing to have Chris out here. Yeah, it was brilliant. What a show! And this is what we're going to bring to you guys. We're going to bring this all the time right and thing. that's what i get like i said the unfiltered historian we we have this um and nathan provost just asked if he could join after chris blacked out so let's, yeah, come nathan on, come some in, let's come talk in. about dumping let's some go. tea in the harbor right. um tyler just quickly i'm sorry for cutting you off a couple of times there mate I do it's okay, it's it's okay. Now, i know you were you were excited about this chat i yeah, yeah. so many times to talk I, you know i don't care. i can't believe we even got complimented uh, on what we're doing man by the greatest 
one of the greatest of all time. But there you go. I know it, you know that it makes my heart happy to hear that. that yeah, my, I'm, I'm to see somebody great. that we started. You know that yeah. I. I really have an admiration for it because wow. he does what, what my dream was always yeah, to Nathan, do. Nathan, come in, man. I need to have a chat with Nathan. To talk about this stuff. Because we in... need to talk about the tea party. <laughs> Did we put that back in again? Anyway, there was lots of questions. We missed them, and I'm so sorry, guys. Um, but Daryl um, actually pointed out something for me because um, I, I meant Hazel Grove. I got Hazel Grove and uh, um, that place mixed up. Well... I will take you to Hazel Grove, so that doesn't. Oh, I want to get Hazel Grove. It's still, that. it's still that line of trees, isn't it? Where it's like a clearing. Is that right? So it's not the original dimensions that it was, mm. which is like kind of sad because I, I really enjoy the dimensions of uh, Hazel Grove today because it still gives you the appreciation for the carnival atmosphere that the artillery has there. And that's yeah. one thing that uh, EPA Alexander knows. There's like a guy cartwheeling and backflipping and just excited on the Confederate line about these shells. He's driving into the lines of the Union troops that are in almost rampant retreat there at Fairview, which is just down that swath clearing that you see at Hazel Grove. Uh, Daryl Noonan, thank you so much for your participation and engagement. And thank you for also being a part of the Unfiltered. Uh, it says that we need to take him to Second Manassas if he has time. I agree. We need to take him to Manassas in general. Take him to Yorktown, too. Nathan was making some funny comments, wasn't he, on your, on your Facebook? Speak of the devil. Oh, Nathan, how are you? Nathan, Look, how are you, sir? He has a shirt on today, has he? Look. I, uh, you know, I actually... Did you chuck it in a bin? I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, I don't know if this is actually a good idea or not, because ultimately... Um, I know that it's going to be kind of hard to replace Chris coming in. Not as interesting. Haven't written about the mine run campaign, but um, I'm glad you guys invited me on. I was happy to. Well, you're an unfiltered historian. Yeah. So you're you're, you're welcome. welcome. Always have the invite. You just got to let us know when you're on. I should have this. Yeah. Like, I, I wish there was an auto link where it was just like, we're live. Join. Like a Google calendar invite. Like could happen yeah that's that but see the, the studio link changes for security reasons every time a new episode airs which also speak of the devil a new episode we have a new provider and i wouldn't say sponsored just yet but we've been um working with some new people and anchor is now working with the unfiltered historians who put us on spotify every episode not just once in a blue moon when we have the money to do so because it was like asking us for like 15 16 dollars an episode which is kind of ludicrous and anchor is now free so if you guys want to listen to this every episode will be up on spotify after today so this episode will be up on spotify just after we're done off air which is awesome so you can drive in your car and listen to us i'm not going to listen to myself back because i, I can't stand i always it. listen to myself always. back because i'm sad because <laughs> i'm sad <laughs> but anyway I... Nathan, so there is... what what's on your mind today mate tell us what you're thinking uh, actually, for one of my classes, I actually had to do a presentation on battlefield preservation. And so that's actually kind of oh, nice. come yeah. on. Awesome. Um, I'm not sure if I can actually, I don't know. Can I share my screen by chance? I don't know if I can. Do you have a picture or something? Because if you do, yeah, just do. Facebook message it to me and I can throw it yeah. up on the picture. Okay, oh, yeah. I'm going to do that. But I think, do you have an option to say share screen? Do you see the share screen thing in the bottom? Uh, I do. That's the thing. I no, it's not letting me. It's, oh, it's like okay, a so big like red admin. line through it. Um, Sorry, you're not a member. You can't no, click it. it. Click it and see what it says. Because I click it, it says you can do so. Okay, let me first. I'm going to get the uh, image here. I thought this was pretty cool here. Um, let me just see if this will work. Um maybe this will work what about if it doesn't send me the image on facebook and i can just open it up wait does that work i don't know yeah yes, it okay. Does. okay cool. Cool. so i came across this today actually in the library of congress um great place so, to do research by the way yes um and this is really weird right because like the the direction north is going to um, my left, probably your right. Um, so this is like Richmond is like up here. Petersburg is down here. But the thing I love about this map is it actually is showing like this map is from 1908. This is from the U.S. Army Engineer Corps at like West Point or something like that. 
and it shows the covered ways it shows the abatis um mm -hmm. all this stuff like in and around petersburg and richmond i just thought it was really cool and i'm like i asked with you guys no, um, that is awesome yeah if, if you wow. want like um i'll try to i don't know if i can make this bigger but like uh, send it to send me the image i okay. can make it because i can throw it on the whole screen that way okay okay and yeah, yeah i'll do Tyler, that. Tyler, Tyler, I'll make it bigger for you um abati yeah. <laughs> if you want to say the french pronunciation how we get in intricate in our history here we call it abati abati sorry abati no it's okay i used to call um, it abatis too and this one's like my... no it's abati i'm like oh my gosh i'm so sorry <laughs> you mentioned in again. <laughs> like, yeah it's yeah no, we're well, talking I, about the French pronunciation of the obstructions he's just, uh, describing there. It's um, Abati and Chabot de Fries and all these different types of obstructions yeah. we're seeing. I understand. I don't like the French. Okay. We've been fighting the French for thousands of years. Okay. I have to look at them every time I go to Asda. Okay? Well, you don't like us either because you're not joking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who, 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 who do the British like? That is a good question. Who do the British <laughs> yeah. like Scots yet? I mean, is the Scott thing like kind of killed over? No, I'm only joking. I, I love you all. I love you too, man. But I'm still. Um, Culloden still holds a place in my heart. Hey, just gonna, Culloden. Culloden? Yes, Culloden. A little angry wow. about that still. Uh, Tyler, I'm actually about to send this over to you. Um, I look forward to it. And you can take a look at it. Um, but and I feel I feel horrible for not having the time for mine run because and again I showed this to Darren. Off it's, it's like Chris asked me that question, didn't he, about what what it is that that might you know got you into it, and it just it is all of it's exciting to me. This right here, buddy. This has had my attention for a while. Titanic yeah. is uh, my first historical obsession. Actually, I was uh, three years old in 1997. It could probably tell you just about as much information as like fucking James Cameron. If you want to talk about Titanic, we can. I don't mind. Oh no, there's a um, so there may be a post stream tonight mind? because I have a software that I just recently I sent you purchased. that great picture earlier. Did you say well, that? Hold on, that, this that is link. you might like this. Darren. Right. I have a exploration app for the wreck of the Titanic. In, it's supposed to be a real time sinking um, video and a uh, <clears throat> exploration video. That um, if that was something that was of interest, I was thinking about streaming and having that be a part of the unfiltered. Since I, I do know quite a bit about it, and I haven't really had the opportunity to talk about it too much, um, I was considering possibly putting that into a video here soon, and um, here soon even being late into tonight because i do not work tonight thankfully i am off I, I do get to go see my daughter which real quick just want to plug this on thanksgiving my daughter took her first steps and i got to see that and that was the greatest freaking feeling in the world my guys like that was that It'll was be, awesome so nothing in this awesome, world will ever be also that. it means you're going to be chasing her around now like a I lunatic no i'm just like can you still crawl <laughs> yeah. like, like, i need you to like super fast like crawl that that's thing. what you need to do you're going too fast dude like yeah Oh my goodness. But yeah, podcasts. Nathan sent us this. Blown up even bigger, oh, guys. Nice. Here you go. Nice, Lovely large, man. and blown up. Yeah, so LOC is a wonderful place, by the way. And mm -hmm. Let me see it if really I can is. show us some real quick. Since we were talking about LOC, I don't know if any of my photos that I've had recently will show up here because I, I decided to download those stupid TIFF files and realized the damage that did to my computer's memory because I have like no memory to even play the games I want to play. Um, I tried to get Call of Duty Vanguard and I spent the money on the game and can't download it because of so many Library of Congress Fredericksburg pictures I have that I'm not willing to part with that I refunded my own game purchase hmm. because of the amount of storage that my computer is just being like consumed with with all these photos but there's things like alfred wood sketches i've never seen before and i remember sitting here for like eight hours the other night just going through these sketches of fredericksburg that were tremendous and things i've never seen like um photos to uh depictions of artillery positions sketched by wood to the scenes around falmouth uh coincidentally 159 years ago to the day just like chris was saying 157 for mine run that's happening right now and again i know this is mine run centric um so the latter part of this stream whichever time we end it could be 7 30 could be 8 whatever i'm not in a rush to end tonight that's for sure 
I haven't got to see you guys all week and it's been a wonderful holiday week. So it's cool to be able to catch up with everybody and have good filter together. I know Tim said he wasn't available for a while, but I might try to uh, coerce him into maybe talking about the Titanic with me later. Um, let me text him real quick to let him know. So sorry for the pause, but you guys feel free to pick up where I left off. That's all right. So Nathan, are you going to uh, come come to uh, Virginia for the weekend when I'm there? Or can is that something you can't manage? Because I can understand you've got work. So. I have to ask what what weekend that is again. Um, yeah, think- sorry. So um, I'm I'm tra- I'm traveling over from the um, 12th to the 19th, so it's a week. Um, but the following weekend after the 11th and 12th, um, so I'm there for the Saturday and the Sunday. I mean, you know, you could come and have a beer, right. and we could do a battlefield. Yeah. I know it's money. That's right. It? We could go to gourmet. We could, you know. Gourmet. Gourmet. So I went back again, dude. I'm not, I left my ID there that night. No one told me that I did that. So I well, called him. I was like, do you that guys have, on that's me. what I said. I was like, do you guys have my ID? They're like, yeah. I'm like, oh, damn. Must be an excuse to come in and get another food item and some beer. So I'll be there. <laughs> I go there and they're like, oh, Tyler, we're out of Falcon Smash. I'll tell you what. I'm so glad I got Fine, that. It's the Hershey's Porter. Oh, yeah. It was so good. It was so good. <laughs> Dude, the food was even better than the beer. Dude. Well, okay, that's a really lengthy statement. I like the but, I like the look of what you had, Nathan. I think you took a oh, picture of it. Was chicken and waffles. Waffles. It was like dude, I had the Southern thing. cookout. I'm like, I was like, my my mouth was watering when I saw that picture. Well, they don't have uh they they might in some places, but around my parts, they don't have chicken and waffles. Uh because it's Kansas, yeah. Kansas, Missouri, it's not really like south right you come so. to virginia though and hey we're going to show you some chicken <laughs> no, but what sort of civil war history have you got around your way because there must be a little uh, bit that's actually a really good question um and this is a conversation that i've had actually with quite a few people um the battle of westport is actually considered a really important um engagement that takes place in the american civil war around kansas city uh, unfortunately, Westport is is now what I call probably one of the most hipster areas you could probably imagine here in Kansas City. Um, fit in well. but it's it's uh, but it, it's been built over. Unfortunately, there's one section that's been preserved over at Loose Park, um, and they have like a small um, sign there, and they have a cannon that basically says, "Yep, Battle of Westport." took place here even though it was a really important engagement um also people in kansas city it's a really especially in the state of missouri it's a very like bitter conflict because you have a lot more guerrilla fighting there's a it's it's a lot more personal you could maybe make the argument that more war crimes actually happened in missouri because events weren't really focused past the mississippi river um and this was considered part of the trans mississippi um i have a colleague who i actually work with he's actually a lincoln scholar uh uh, like he i'm so like i mean he's a he's um he focuses on lincoln he's actually writing a uh he's just about to put out a book about edward bates who is a part of lincoln's cabinet Mm -hmm. um and so it you know that should be coming out soon but but he his next he's planning his next biography on being about samuel curtis who is known for his victory at p ridge um he's also known for the battle of westport as well um there, but there's a lot of engagements that take place actually here in missouri um in fact i think it actually had the third most engagements or battles of any state during the war uh but they're a lot smaller and um they're not as well known uh so there's like the battle of newtonia the second battle of newtonia um you have even the battle of springfield um all of these different engagements take place uh in the state of missouri there's a and then of course people in kansas and missouri um they will make the argument that the war actually began starting with bleeding kansas so the war didn't begin in 1861 it started before that yeah it starts with john brown and all that yeah yeah so we so there's like this weird border war and that's why like the two universities like of kansas university and mizzou 
there's been historically a rivalry because of the Jayhawkers, the Bushwhackers, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool stuff, though. I like all that sort of stuff. It's it's uh, it's but strange. It's not enough to. Yeah. But you know, I will say the cool thing about the um, state capitol in Kansas is if you go inside, there is a huge mural mural of John Brown holding the Bible and his gun. And you better believe in Kansas, um, it's blasphemy to say that, you know, John Brown was a terrorist. Um, yeah. Because around these parts, people love John Brown. So yeah. um, so it's one of those things where, unfortunately, a lot of the preservation has gone by the wayside. Um, and there's a lot of research that still needs to be done regarding um, Missouri and Kansas because it's just not as well known. Um, no. In fact, there um, there's a number of engagements that even in, that bleed like bleed into the state of Oklahoma, which is down south um, as well. So the Battle of Honey Springs, uh, very very important engagement um, as well. So you've got the mass that massacre at St. Trillia, is that correct? Yep, that's that, right. Yeah, that was horrendous. Um, that was. Mm -hmm. um, and so the only connections that I really have to the Civil War would actually be on my mother's side, mm -hmm. who um, part of them, they're, they're German, they're from Munich. And back in around 1848, which I find interesting because that's the year of the European revolutions that take place, um, I had... Um, a great grandfather. Um, his last name was was uh, Fick, but he changed it to English spelling. But it was uh, like Friedrich von, you know, Fick or something like that. But uh, he immigrates to St. Louis because there's a large German population. Uh, he joins the Lutheran Church and then he's conscripted conscripted into uh, the Missouri Calvary. Um, and he will actually fight at the uh, 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 Battle of Westport. So, um, you know, that's that's really the only connection I have to the Civil War. Um, you know, other than that, that's that's about it. Um, so, the rest of my family was in Canada. They were just a bunch of you know French Canadians just hanging out, waiting for the stuff to end. So, you know, <laughs> um, but but needless to say, it's a really good question and. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you probably know a lot more than most people know here, even in Missouri. Most people have no idea that battles took place here in Missouri. And again, it's a lot of, it's like you said, it's, um, um, well, it's the Trans Mississippi. That's what they call it, don't they? Yeah, yeah it is. And, and, and there's a lot of, like you said, it's like uh, more like um, guerrilla bands going around and uh, getting chased around by Union Army. Yeah, and it's pretty personal. I mean, it's mm. um, it gets pretty nasty. Yeah, I mean, St. Trillia yeah. is horrendous. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, Bart, Bart and Myers knows a lot about that. Actually, it's very interesting. We touched a little bit about it on one of my podcasts that I did with him. Um, mm -hmm. but, um for people that are not familiar with St. Trillia, it's a, a complete massacre. And uh, what's the guy's name? Um, the guy that he's a real nasty guy. Oh, I can't remember his name. But they basically um, all Union soldiers. Um, hmm. uh, was oh, it bloody, bloody Bill, Bill Anderson. Anderson? Bloody Bill Anderson. Yeah, that's right. And, oh, and, no and, wonder and you don't they, remember his name. They don't show any quarter, and then afterwards they massacre. Mm -hmm. They 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 mutilate the bodies. It, it, it's, it was, it's not nice. No, mm -hmm. and um, there's actually there's a study done on northwestern Missouri where the Union Army that was there, they were having such problems with um, Confederate, Confederate guerrillas that um, it was actually William Sherman's, uh, I believe it was his brother uh, who was in command there. And they just ultimately decided they would burn three entire counties. No, like no questions asked. And they would tell these civilians, like, all your stuff is going to, like, be gone unless you come live on a Union base. Right. And apparently it was so devastating that the, so the soil composition and the environment actually still suffers as a result of that burning even today. Wow. 
Um, so the fact that, you know, there's all this going on and, you know, it's, it's not well remembered. I, you know, I, I've made mention of this to my students, um, as well as some of my peers and they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's just, it, it's one of those things that just kind of. So, so you teach over. history, Nathan, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So you sort of like, you, you sort of cover pretty much everything then basically from the revolution um, to cover everything and sometimes more that's not even a part of the curriculum. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's it like teaching young, younger people? Is it, do you, who'd put that up? <laughs> well, I think Tyler could also answer this question as well. Um, <laughs> I, it's, it's, you, you know, okay. I, I, all I will say about it is, it has its challenges. Um, mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, there are students that are really going to benefit um, from that information. Yeah. And, and I tell them all the time, you know, I don't, I don't expect you to love history because there's a lot of people that don't. Um, and yeah, in fact, right, yeah. I, I love the fact that. <laughs> it's a, I'm going to swear in a minute. Gonna... <laughs> I love the fact that, you know, that other students are obsessed with things like math and science because we need that. Yeah, um, do, yeah. Otherwise you end up I, like me. <laughs> but I want them to that's use critical awesome, thinking skills. Absolutely. That's what history is all about, man. Is mm -hmm. I'll take my hat off to you, mate. Skills. Honestly, I really do. You know, because uh, that, that must, that is a, for anybody, you know, it's a hard job. Uh, what, what ages are they? They're eighth grade. They're uh, 13 and 14. They yeah, so they're really, really difficult. I can imagine. <laughs> All the cheek in the mouth. Yeah. They, hey, you know what? It's just, uh, it's growing pains, you know? So. Yeah. But you're, um, you're, you know, you, you've you got a hand in somebody's future. It's pretty cool. You know. uh, it, it is. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where I think that right now I, I just, I just care about the fact that they just are learning the content. They're just trying to get it down. So yeah, that's cool. That's, that's all I care about. Um, but yeah, no, um, Darren, I'm going to definitely try to come see you at some point, whether that's in England or in Virginia. Yeah, that'd be cool, man. I mean, like I said, I'll take you around and take you some, some good places. Yeah, no, I, I've got to visit him in England too. There's so many. And, and again, um, my round table meets in London, and literally, it's a stone's throw from Trafalgar Square and the Strand That's and cool. all of the main sites. So, uh, we would love you to come on our um, round table meeting and talk about Grant. They would I'd love to. They would love that. Yeah, no, I would. I'm seeing and, and uh, spend £10 on a pint. Absolutely. Do you, do you want me to wear a Napoleon shirt or is that like a... Well, I have a George Washington get, hoodie that you want to get that you should up. definitely I'm wear sure. while you're there. Wear your Washington hoodie. This also, week. Nate, I will take you to some uh, um, Napoleonic fortifications in my area. So I actually watched your video about that and I thought that was very, very cool. Um, Which one was that, mate? uh it was it was on the coast um oh god which one was that um i can't remember off the top of my head but you yeah. did a whole thing about one particular fortress and it, it was built um when they were actually afraid napoleon well napoleon was planning his invasion of england yeah um and so there's this you know that's when they built it um was around that time yeah, uh, so there's there's one in Dover, which is just down the road from me. It's called that's the one. That's Western the one. Heights. Yeah, I haven't actually done a video on that yet properly, but there's a there's a thing called um like I told you about. I sent you those pictures and I about the um the Grand Shaft. It's just a feat of engineering. It's like drilled in. They drilled like a a, um, a shaft into the cliff so soldiers could go down. You know, uh, the, and this place up there's abandoned, man. There's all overgrown, and there's there's somebody who looks after it, but it's. It, I can't get hold of them. I'm trying to get hold of these people because I don't, you know, I want to go visit. I want to go look around it properly, you know. But that is an amazing place, I tell you. Darren, I should I should tell you actually, um, and I don't know if you'll find this interesting or not, but um, in Istanbul, in Turkey, there's actually a British graveyard dedicated to British vets. 
Mm -hmm. And the caretaker there is actually gets paid by the English government to take care of this cemetery. Yep. And this cemetery is actually owned by the British government. It's upheld. And these are soldiers that fought in the Crimean War, oh, no. which to tie in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of um, Civil War officers had read about the Crimean War. I believe mm -hmm. George D. McClellan actually yeah. was an observer yeah. um, of was, the Crimean yeah. War. And, and that's when you get like the advance in sort of a little bit of the technology side of it that then goes mm -hmm. into the Civil War as far as rifles are concerned. And I don't really know a lot about Crimean War, actually. It's something that I need to start looking at a bit more. And I'm really annoyed, actually, because when I was at Horse Guards Parade, there's a cannon there that was captured at Sebastopol. Is that during was... Crimean? Yeah, and it's in Horse yeah. Guards Parade, and I forgot about it, and I should have gone up and, and, and filmed it, and I really annoyed myself now. I only mind. focus on mm -hmm. Crimea just to see if there's any connection to the tactics yeah, to the Civil War, or operations yeah. to yeah. the Civil War. Yeah, definitely. Um, George B. McClellan noted, and this is actually funny that he noted this. Um, he said the greatest maneuver of this war was actually the retreat that the Russians um, did it, toward, towards the end. And so it's kind of funny that that to him is like mm -hmm. great maneuver is their retreat um so it always kind of makes me laugh a bit when mcclellan notes that because it's like well you're gonna do that here pretty soon on the peninsula um yeah so you know with that said i i i think it's important to study if you want to understand civil war fortifications and and how that influenced um, their thinking, but mm. you know, I I only bring again, like you know, a lot of people always uh, criticize tactics in the American Civil War, but you got to remember all of these West Pointers. That's the tactics they learned, so they're not they're going to use those tactics. You know, the tactics yeah. of fighting in line, shoulder to shoulder, Napoleonic tactics. That is what they all got taught at West Point, right? And there's that's actually why they fight like that. You know, but the um, weapons are just too deadly. You know, that's the problem, isn't it? You know? There's um, a number of um, historians that make the remark that tactics in 19th century warfare meant little to nothing at all. Um, and now that's something that, you know, you can agree or disagree with. Um, I believe it was Jeffrey Pere that made note of that argument. Um, and he, he says so because of the difficulty in coordinating um, mass assaults against certain positions was almost impossible. Um, he said guys like Napoleon were lucky to actually have the core commanders that he did because his core commanders were actually very, very effective and very good at coordinating those attacks. And they all understood their role in accordance to what Napoleon expected of them. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of other militaries, and it's not just in the American Civil War. I mean, you look at the Paraguayan War. You look mm -hmm. at um, any other war that really takes place in the 19th century, even in the Crimean War, um, even the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, coordination was not at its peak performance uh but then again that draws into other problems right with things like communication issues um as well and in the fact that you know generals were still able to somewhat put together these assaults is actually pretty impressive um and yeah. um, also you think grant really sort of adopts um is it Grant or Sherman? One of them adopts uh, Napoleon's tactics. You know, when Napoleon invades, goes on his invasion and, uh, you know, they adopt his his tactics as far as going off and living off the land, don't they? That They, they sort of use that. I mean, Grant uses that during the Vicksburg campaign, doesn't he, where he just literally goes off the map for two weeks or three weeks and they don't know where he is, but he uses the land as he goes along for the army. You know, and right. Napoleon actually invented that tactic, didn't he? Yeah, and he also invented canned food. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, the, ah, uh, yeah, hey, Hyder Pasta Cemetery. That's exactly right. Um, I was there. It's beautiful. Um, but the, uh, 
tactics uh they grant yeah he works with it. a lot of that also comes from napoleon look napoleon's going to influence all 19th century warfare i mean everyone wants to be napoleon mm -hmm. um hence everyone has their hand in their jacket um mm -hmm. you know so yeah. I, w with that said you know n everyone wants to win that decisive battle i mean even grant believes in the idea of a decisive battle even after the Battle of Shiloh, he believes that that is going to work. Um, he stops believing that pretty quickly, um, not long after. But Robert E. Lee is going to keep trying to look for that decisive victory really up until, I mean, 1865. I mean, from what I read, I mean, he really gives up on the war come November of 1864. Um so, you know, I, I know that that's what he was always looking for. Generals always looked for that decisive victory um, because that's what the public looked for as well. So, uh, you know, but I think, and, and, you know, unfortunately, Napoleon, he gets to a point where, like, he, he reaches his peak very early on in his career, and then he never really develops anything innovative or new after that. And then everyone just takes on takes after that, um, and they learn from it. Another so, great example of that is Winfield Scott. He does the same thing into Mexico, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Where he literally that's just exactly goes right. off on, on a badge. And of course, that's where a lot of Civil War generals learn their trade from him. You know, he just goes, you know what? Let's just go off the, and we'll we'll live off the land. And that's an excellent, excellent point that you bring up because the Mexican American War. I mean, we can talk about you know, military theory, tactics, tactics, whatever, but you really don't learn anything until you're actually in the field. Um, and the Mexican American war is going to influence guys like Grant and a ton of Confederate officers. Um, and you, you're actually going to read from Grant's memoirs that, yeah, he found Scott's invasion extremely impressive and he's going to remember that. Yeah. Um, so real quick, Noel, just um, 15 minutes ago, I just realized that he uh, had commented and he sent us a cool yeah, video, uh, picture sure. here. The map of Rappahannock River below Fredericksburg showing Port Royal, Moss Neck, and Corbin's Neck, etc. Noel, you are so wonderful. I can't help but just to admire your work. We're going to go ahead and download this picture and share it with our folks here. I can't help but just to admire your work. We're going to go ahead and download this picture and oh. see with our folks here. <laughs> yeah. And let's see if I can get it. We're going to go ahead and download this picture and oh. see with our <laughs> Who's <laughs> echoing? That's my bad. Sorry. We're going to go ahead and download this picture. Bloody, bloody <laughs> pain in the backside. <laughs> it's okay. I can edit that out later. If I don't, it's raw and it's unfiltered like we're supposed uh, to. It's unfiltered. Sorry, yeah, never right. it happens. I was just making sure so much because I thought I was echoing you know what? Like, what exiting really tabs is, extremely is, is quickly. Having the opportunity just to sit here and geek out about what I love about history. Yeah. That's what we do. I, I mean, just, it's, I, it's I, the greatest just, part again. about this. Oh, go on. Sorry. Let's look at this map. There we go. Wow. Okay. Can can you remind me? I, even though I've heard I, I heard of Second Fredericksburg, can you remind me? what that is when that's right important. okay so oh, oh so that's in may of 1863 yeah. right during go. chancellorsville hooker wants to split a, a an attack so his attacks happening at chancellorsville obviously we are all focused on what's going on east of fredericksburg or west of fredericksburg 13 right. miles west of fredericksburg but in fredericksburg there is an assault happening we have john reynolds first corps we have John Sedgwick also attacking. John Sedgwick is positioned and moving forward, and so is uh, Reynolds. Well, what accumulates in all this is there's a Union push onto Marie's Heights where they actually see that the line is very spread thin on the sunken road. And the Union forces, after a ceasefire slash truce, actually, wait a minute, we can take that wall. And they do so. They actually storm up the walls, storm the heights of Marie's Heights, and they attack the very top where my great-great-grandfather is in Parker's Virginia Battery. A small um, portion of that battery is up there on the hill. It actually gets overrun by some Vermonters. Uh, but they keep pushing from Marie's Heights and heading west towards Chancellorsville to link up with the Union Army, almost like a pincer movement, if you will. And they get utterly repulsed to Salem Church and pushed across the Rappahannock River to be 
just quite frank with you. Um, that That's a very important aspect of the Chancellor's Will campaign that just goes unnoticed since we're on the topic of forgotten battles like Mine Run, you know, 157 years ago to the day. I believe it's 157, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It might be 158. Um, 63B. Yeah, yeah, it would be 158 years ago, actually. Do you, th do you think the pincer movement was a sound decision? I, I personally think, yeah, and not only that, I think it was actually, yeah. Joe, uh, sorry, Joe Hooker didn't want Sedgwick or Reynolds anywhere near him because they had done a lot of backstabbing at, um, to, to Burnside at Fredericksburg, the first Fredericksburg. Well, Hooker so, did some bad backstabbing of, um, I mean, look at the letter, you have publicly yeah. thwarted yeah, You know what your, I'm trying yeah. to say? So from what I've read, that he, he wanted them down at Fredericksburg out the way so they weren't getting in his way why he was advancing on Lee at Chancellorsville, you know, further up. So that's I why he, the way I understood it is that he didn't want them, you know, around and he just wanted to get rid of them down there. You go down there and leave yeah. me alone sort of thing. But I mean, it's, it turns into a good move, really. I mean, they had a great opportunity there, didn't they, Tyler? Mm, they did. They had a, a tremendous opportunity to win the Battle of Chancellorsville. But like Hooker says himself, that Hooker lost faith in Joe Hooker. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, you know, we, we look at Hooker instrumenting or implementing, excuse me, a fantastic and sound plan, but with him losing faith in himself, he can't really execute that. You know what I mean? So there's not a chance for him to have the success that he thinks he's going to have or that he hopes he's going to have because of that failure on his own part. And I think that's what really ties yeah, I mean, they the, used the, the same crossing, don't they, that um, George Meade used. Is that right? Sedgwick's core. And then uh, mm -hmm. there's also um, a drunken, uh, I brought it up last time, I think. There's a drunken... Um, Benham, not Burnham. Yes, I got yeah, that wrong. It's Henry yeah, Benham. He falls off he, the There's an account face. of him falling on his face and lacerating yeah. the shit out of his face. And he's like... Rrr, 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 rrr. like he's making all these like ungodly commands and just like saying these horrible things. But he's like belligerently drunk, dude. I mean... That there was something in his canteen that was not water and beeswax, that's for sure. It was something else. And I mean, there, there's so many things that tie into Second Fredericksburg that just yeah. make it a very unique campaign. Um, but unfortunately, there's not much left of Second Fredericksburg. No. And I imagine that's that because a lot's been built over it. A lot like Kansas City. Um, Tyler, have you still got those pictures of Second Fredericksburg? You know, the, the one with the tree and the, where the guys are sitting up against the tree? That was actually um, after Wilderness, the one I showed you, that really oh, yeah, eerie picture. Right, yeah. So now you showed me something last week about Second Project, but I can't remember what it was. There was a few pictures you brought up last week, I can't remember. Because we were discussing it, weren't we? The one where you could still see the battle smoke, there There was a photo taken across the river oh, yeah. where you can actually see the battle. It's like one of the only pictures, I think, of the war that's taken in the midst of a battle where you can actually see the smoke in the town of Fredericksburg hovering over Maurice Heights, where there's a freaking paddle just like roaring while this uh, photographer is taking a picture of it. It's very cool too. Let me see if I can't pull that up. It's somewhere in my files here. I don't know exactly which it is because I have put up so many pictures since then. What is this one? No, that's that's the field day attack across in both yeah. 62 and 64, but that's not the one. I'll have to put that up next episode because I have no idea. Go ahead and download this picture. Oh, now I'm echoing, I think. Yeah. Oh, no, that's not me echoing. There's another echo somewhere. Was that you again, Nate? What? I heard echoing again. I was like, where is this coming from? Yeah, it's not. I don't that's, think it's me. No, that's weird. That's that's okay. I don't care. I was. I just want to make sure I'm not going crazy. And no, I think it keeps um, pulling up because I'm trying to look at. Sorry, some of the comments that were coming in. Oh, you're good. I appreciate that. Someone's got to look at it. Cause I can't because I when I did it, mine was echoing too. I had to shut that quickly. Well, and of course, like I put myself on mute and then I paused the video. But as soon as I switch back over, <laughs> it's, it's like rah, 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 rah. it's okay. It's no problem. Well, guys, um, we're nearing our mark here. Um, I plan to do an unfiltered conversations after work tomorrow. I'd have to check my schedule, make sure what time I'm off, but I'll get back with some of the unfiltered guys and see what time I'm off. If anyone wants to join just for another bullshit conversation like we did after the video tonight, I'm very much open for that. So you guys let me know what you're looking like tomorrow evening.
Yeah, I'm not good. I'm not doing anything. I'm not either. But, so that's that. I've got Made a really, really exciting um, reenactment um, AGM tomorrow. That's going to be exciting. Where at? Um, just up the road from me. Okay. So I'm on the committee, so I've got to be there. I am You're publicity the officer for Southern Skirmish Association. Oh, and well, also I have also recently, joined the Sons of Union Veterans, by the way, and I'm the patriotic instructor oh, of the nice. Sons of Union Veterans. So my job is to find oh, no. the um, patriotic stories from the Civil War and explain and a little in-depth about I'm also on the committee of the Roundtable UK, which I got voted on two weekends ago. So, yeah, it's really well, cool. Congratulations. And again, that's why I'm plugging you for London, Nate. You're coming to London and you're going to be in the round table. You're going to talk about Grant. That'd be cool. Do you ever need an Upton guy to come, guy to come talk? Yeah. I, I don't same know. Same. I can say much about Grant, but I can talk a hell of a lot yeah, about Upton. About, so. you're, you're going to be doing uh, Fredericksburg and all that stuff. Oh, that's cool too. I would love to take Fredericksburg trains and go into that. Well, and guys, then again, do you have any last minute see, thoughts uh, for us? Oliver Cromwell and um, Winston oh. Churchill and Lincoln in Parliament Square. Oh, get drunk. That part's cool, too. I like that. Well, guys, again, if there's any last-minute thoughts, anything anyone wants to add, please, now is the time to do so because we're closing out here. I just want to thank everyone for joining in and watching and thank Chris and thank Nate and thank everyone. And, yeah, um, thanks for not mentioning the revolution. Oh, you did. Um, yeah. <laughs> One day, Darren. One day. <laughs> thanks, set me and off again. In a couple days, we have this going on. The Rappahannock Tea Party of 2021. Yeah. The, the Rappahannock Tea Bagging of 21. Tea Bagging? No, I said Tea Party. There are two yeah, different no, things there, buddy. <laughs> Guys, again, I want to appreciate, or Wrong I do channel. appreciate every single one of y'all. Jay Bevan says, great talk once again. Thanks. I love your Red Dead character in the profile picture, by the way, man. That's pretty badass, actually. Yeah, that's. A I'm gonna cool be. Game. Um, I, you guys I, ever played that I, game? I love that. Oh, game. I played all the time, but I just, as we were talking, actually deleted it out of my space as we were doing that yeah. talk because uh, Call of Duty Vanguard's had freaking twenty. The thing is, I end up getting download. banned from all the towns because I go off on a tangent sometimes. You know, when you get bored and you just start like randomly you just start shooting, like, looting people and that. You know, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that you go and do that. Do, like, do not you know what, very, oh, very British of you. Say really funny. I was, I was riding along one day on it, and I came across the KKK in the woods doing like yep. a ceremony. Yeah, that's in the game. No word of a lie, and so I shot them all. <laughs> Good. If you wait and watch, they all burn because they fall in the fire. Do they? So it's great. Yeah, they do. They um, the scene I came across, they all just started burning in the fire, and I was like, oh, this is pleasant. I pulled out. I had a um, what did the, the like the whatever their version of the Henry rifle was. I had that pulled and aimed at them the entire time, and I was just ready to start blasting heads. And then all of a sudden, they just fell into a fire, and I was like, "Okay, <laughs> did it for me." Yeah. It works. Yeah, Red Dead's a very fun game, but hopefully, Call of Duty Vanguard is going to be cool too. I know there's no historical accuracy to that crap whatsoever. It's a Call of Duty game, so yeah. it's wait, you mean nothing historically not historical? No, dude, it's not actually. It's just was, they I say our oh, our yeah, historical. Anyway, base I game. think at some point we definitely need to have a oh, grant not. chat. Very cool. Chat. And you're you're the I feel like I do that in that point. I make sure to bring him up. We definitely need a grant chat. <laughs> mm. I love actual fact, minute. right? Um, I do a really boring, mundane job sometimes, where I stand there for two hours doing the same thing, and I put. I'm not going to say what I do, but it's really boring and it gives me a lot of time to think. And this week I've thought up so many ideas, it's unreal. I've got ideas going around in my head. You know, we've well, got loads I'm excited of stuff, to honestly, hear man. We've got some stuff coming up. So keep watching, guys. Yeah, guys. And again, y'all are awesome for joining tonight. Thank you. Huge thank you to Chris Mikowski for joining us tonight. And his insight on the Mind Run campaign was incredible. Um, Darren, you asked some great questions. Hey, and uh, Jay Bevan just linked himself there. If anybody ever wants to play Red Dead with Jay Bevan, it's Hardy1863. But with that being said, guys, y'all have a wonderful Saturday night. Have some beer for me, please, because I know I'm about to have a few more. Y'all in um, the, the stream, stick around for a minute as we close so I can finish closing out with you guys, too, um, after we end our live video. And we will see y'all tomorrow night.